For our next talk, we will be having April Scher, who has spent the last five years as an engineer in the defense industry, which included developing avionic and navigation systems. Currently, she works on reverse engineering and pen testing embedded systems while part-timing as an MS computer engineering student. Today, she'll be talking about intro to hardware RE and an overview on commonly used tools and hardware components. So I will send this off to you, April. Um, hi, thank you. Um, so let me just share my screen. Can I do that right now? Yes. Okay. Um, all right. So yeah, thanks for the introduction. So this is just an uh, intro to hardware RE. Um, so before, as she said it, before I became a security engineer, um, I was in digital engineering. And so a lot of my background comes from, um, you know, debugging PCB boards. Um, and some of it is just my own hobby that I do for fun. So why reverse hardware? Um, Explore various circuit designs. So Usually when you're studying engineering, you don't get a chance to really um, see how other people do things. You have your basic circuits and topologies that you see in, in classes, but you don't get that, um, that, I guess, the exploration that you'd usually get like if you were an architecture student. Um, learn to repair electronics. This is a very liberating skill to have. Um, when you break something, being able to be like, oh, I can fix it, or let me just get the parts. It, you know, instead of freaking out how much it's gonna cost, pay somebody $400 to repair a $600 phone, you know, it's nice to have that skill. And um, firmware, finding firmware bugs and backdoors. Um, I know there's like a, a big scare in, you know, this router that I have from China, is, is there a backdoor in it? Is NSA looking at me? Um, well, now you can just look and see for yourself. So I'm going to break this talk into some core steps, uh, taking apart enclosures, like how to get to the hardware, um, identifying components and functional blocks, and um, interfacing with the hardware. And I'll be going the necessary tools for each step, uh, just so it's not just a big dump up front. Um, hopefully, that'll make it easier to understand. And this talk is kind of focused towards beginners. so. Um, I'm sorry if, if it's too beginner or uh, if I'm not really clear on stuff or I'm very broad, let me know at the end. Um, this is the first time I do this talk, so I'd really enjoy your feedback. Okay, so I will be doing a giveaway. So since you're gonna be sitting through hearing me rambling on, um, I'll put a link, but the chat disappeared. So um, I'll put it in the Discord. And so these donuts will be appearing throughout the talk. So just answer would, what donut appeared when, and I'll be giving away um, two gift cards to Spark Funny Electronics. Hopefully this can get you off into collecting your tool set. Um, I am giving enough so you can get a bus pirate with um, taxes and shipping. I mean, it might be a couple dollars off, but uh, yeah, I mean, a giveaway is a giveaway, right? And it's not pasting, awesome. Okay, just give me a moment. All right, so it's in the main chat. And if you can edit it for or repaste, no, nope, I got it. All right, so hopefully you guys can see that. Uh, April, right. I'm not sure if it's going through. Are, are you pasting it in the I Zoom did it chat? in the Discord. Let me oh, see okay. the Zoom chat. Uh, don't worry, I oh, got it. Here's the chat. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, Hannah, okay. you'll need to change it to all panelists and attendees. I think only us three can see it at the moment. Sorry about that, April. Thanks, thank I appreciate it. Um, so first of all, keeping yourself physically safe. Um, I mean, there's gonna be, so things that plug into the wall, they're high voltage um, and high current. Uh, I think it's like anything above 10 milliamps can kill you, especially it goes across your heart. Um, it can injure you. Uh, it's very fatal. Uh, and just to give you an idea, I think the wall plug is 120 volts and 15 amps. So if anything goes into the wall, um, watch out for that. Be wary of lithium ion batteries, especially if they look expanded. Um, just you know, put it in a nice enclosure, 
find somewhere to, to safely expose that. Um, I like to disconnect batteries and just have, you know, a power supply applying power versus having it there. Um, and cautionary steps. So when you unplug in a device because of capacitors and they hold a charge for some time, there's, you, there's still potential to be shocked. So just let it sit there for a while before you handle anything. Um, removing jewelry and, and tying back hair. And if you're using a soldering iron or if you have some something that's conductive on you and you're not you know, being aware of it, you're focused on, on the device, uh, you know, that can be dangerous. Wear rubber shoes or use a rubber mat and um, make sure that you and the area is dry. Uh, you know, it, it's, it, it's more dangerous to, to touch like a, a live wire with, with wet hand than just with the dry hand. Um, and then use one hand uh, when you're working with the electronics, especially if it's high voltage, just keep it in your pocket. That's um, an adage that people say all the time uh, while using only one hand to, to engage with the circuit. All right, so keeping the hardware safe. Uh, so many electronic components can be damaged through electrostatic discharge. Um, and so you'd want, you don't really have to do this if, if especially if you're being very invasive and you're not really um, trying to like save the device, uh, but having an ESD mat is very helpful. Um, dis discharge yourself before you, you, before you touch the hardware. Um, this is a trick I do all the time. So um, if there's something that's touching the ground or maybe you, um, if your station's grounded, just touch the ground wire really fast. And, and if you have any charge um, on you, um, it should go off. Uh, and store your hardware in ESD safe bags. Don't place them on top though, because the bags are conductive. So um, I know it's very common that people pull it out, put it on top. No, just set it on the side. Uh, only let the hardware touch it when it's in the inside. And um, try and find a place that's not carpet. And then you can see my, I have carpet back here. And so I'm being a hypocrite, uh, you know, shuffling around with your socks and, and um, on carpet, you're gonna collect a charge. And so don't follow me. Okay, keeping yourself legally safe. Um, of course, when it comes to hacking, when it comes to um, pulling firmware from hardware and then like don't, Make sure you go over the legalities of things before you post it up for everyone to see. Um, you know, people have been burned by legal terms, by terms of service. Um, so there, there's a link there to help you. Um, just be aware of doing something before, before you start telling the world about it. Okay, so first, taking apart enclosures. So, I mean, very simple. So screws and, so screws and screwdrivers, um, a lot of times, Hardware enclosures have um, proprietary screws. Um, so, or even some that you don't really see all the time, but usually if you just go and get like a repair kit, it, it should be enough to put you off for some time. Um, and then you can just kind of go and collect as you see um, screws that you might not have in your screw set. Uh, screws like to hide. So check under like foot pads, check under stickers. Um, I know for sometimes like you kind of feel under the stickers like, oh, like where's the divot at? Uh, and sometimes it's just kind of like a plastic little divot belly button and there's no screw there and it's always sad. But uh, yeah, check under things, they're hiding, they're out there. So getting around clasps and adhesive. Um, for this one, you're going to need a, a heat gun. Um, and these are called spongers on the side here. Uh, a plectrum, sorry, I, I just call them like, just like shims and thin things. Uh, and so for adhesives, these adhesives, usually what you see in like a lot of modern devices, these are really strong. Um, and so I wanted just to try it out like, hey, like maybe I don't want to spend $70 on a heat gun. Let me see if I can do it myself. It's really tough. And so um, when you're kind of, I guess, trying to like um, get leverage underneath a screen or underneath adhesive, um, just be aware of the force that you're giving, be aware of what toll you're giving. Um, I was, I think the first time I did it, I was really surprised um, at, that I cut my finger. I didn't even feel it just cause I was holding like this metal shim so tight and really trying to give like just, you know, that force that you can get under but not really break the screen. Um, so 
yes, you'll need those. Uh, oh, and here I go over it again. Um, so yeah, so be careful about the force you're giving. Be aware of, um, of I guess, the material malleability of the device you're trying to open and the tool that you're using to try and open it. Uh, here I have, um, I was, I think I was just updating my laptop and I used a metal one, but I, I didn't, I didn't even think about like, oh, like it's, it's gonna cause these little divots. Um, so if, if the tool you're using is, is rougher than, than the enclosure, you're going to destroy the enclosure. Um, on the other side, if the enclosure is tougher than the tool you're using, you're gonna mess up your tools. And if you kind of go back and, and look closely at my tools, they're, they're kind of messed up, um, but, but they're cheap. You can go and get them online for like $10. Um, be careful with heat. Um, if you're using a heat gun, you can burn yourself. Um, you can also melt stuff. And um, sometimes it's inevitable that you're gonna destroy things. So this is like a TP-Link travel router um, that I opened up. And like, if you see, like, you see that there's damage here, but they kind of like, they probably used a process where they heat it to kind of like do this final, um, to seal it up. So opening it up, it's gonna break. So, so, you know, before you open something, decide like, do I want this to be usable again? Or do I want it to look kind of janky afterwards? Maybe buy a couple so you can practice or so if you mess up, right? Okay, removing connectors and shields. So modern devices, they, you know, um, now that they're, they're high frequency or um, they're sensitive to, to electromagnetic um, interference or whatever, you, or they're even trying to protect their own hardware. You have the, these are called EMI shields. They're a pain in the ass. Um, oh, sorry. Um, and so you, there's different ways you can go about it. You can get a heat gun, heat it up, pull them off or get a soldering iron and try and lift it off. Um, or get the, there's these clippers um, that you usually see for like clipping off leads for on, on boards or, or when you're soldering and you kind of just, you can take it out. But I mean, you can see right here, I wasn't successful. Like I gripped the board. Um, so the damage is gonna happen. Uh, and also when you're opening things, um, be aware of connectors. So, you know, this was a Kindle Fire, so it, the screen's on top. And so once you get the adhesive off, there's um, a ribbon and you can see the ribbon up here. Um, so what, don't pull it off right away, be gentle, kind of be aware like, oh, what, what's connected to what? Do I need to pull something out before I completely um, free the, the cover from, from the base? And, um, and I haven't really seen these before, but usually I'm, I'm used to terminators that you just kind of plug in these ones kind of lift up um, and you can pull out the ribbon. So you'd kind of, yeah, so it's just like a little hinge. And these ones up here, I know it's not that big. Um, they, you don't pull them out, you, you lift them up. Um, so, so be aware of that. Try to like, what is the, how is the Terminator designed? Um, you know, if you were just kind of being quick about it, you'd be like, oh, yank out the wire and then you're, you don't have a connector anymore. You have to you have to replace that. And no one ever mentions this, but it's going to be nice to have a vacuum. Possibly one with the long detailing hose so you can suck things up. Um, there's going to be dust bunnies, and um, I like to go and get some used hardware. Or if someone's trying to give away hardware, I take it, even though it's not operational, just so I can have practice or just to look if it's something I haven't looked at yet and I'm curious. Um, so have compressed air, have an open space where you don't mind blowing around dust and spiders and then, you know, breathe. I'm scared of spiders, so I never liked this part. All right, maple glazed donut. So keep that in mind and I'll take a sip of my coffee. Okay. So identifying components and functional blocks. So for this step, you're going to need um, a microscope or jeweler's loop. So a lot of components are very small. Um, I never, I haven't splurged on a microscope yet. So I just have a jeweler's loop and that's fine for me. 
um, Google because you're going to need to go look and hunt for some data sheets an oscilloscope. Um, and that's for measuring, uh, you know, varying voltages. Uh, I don't know a better way of explaining it, but, you know, something that's not just a constant. So if you're looking at square waves, if you're looking at sinusoidal waves, an oscilloscope is going to be very helpful with that. Um, multimeter. Um, sometimes it's it's really easy to, to debug. You don't need the whole oscilloscope. You can just kind of make sure like, hey, um, is, is this is this wire live or is it um, going up and down just so you know that something's happening on the wire that's helpful and also continuity. So continuity is something that you'll probably be using a lot um, into trying to figure out what's connected, what like what wires are connected to what. And then a schematic or drawing tool. So um, I mean, maybe you're not like me, maybe you're not a scumbag and, and you actually like to document what your process is. And I, I recommend that because you're not going to remember um, if you're looking at different things. Um, so, so schematic versus drawing tool. Um, I would say go and just do the schematic, go use KiCad or Eagle and, and draw up the schematic, but you might run into some snafus. So not all hardware is commercial off the shelf and not all hardware is going to be something that you can go and find. Um, sometimes there's a lot of custom ASICs, there's a lot of custom ICs out there. And so when you look for it, it's, you, you won't be able to drag and drop. And so you're going to have to go through the arduous process of trying to find, trying to find or build something to kind of represent that in a schematic tool. Whereas in Visio or LibreOffice, you can just, you know, draw a box, draw some lines and be like, you know, this is, this is black box B or black chip B, you know, it can, you can put a holding spot a little better. And it's also, you know, shorten the learning curve a little bit, take a step at a time. If you haven't done, um, if you haven't worked with the schematic program yet, you know, you can, you can hold that off. Okay, so identifying components. So this is the same TP link that I opened up um, earlier. And so first things first, you wanna just go and look at the ICs, the chips on the board. Um, I was chicken because I still want to use this device to open up this EMI shield. You can also see this this um, this heat sink there, clay heat sink. Um, so I, I did not open that up. But um, so here is like a, a Ethernet controller. So it helps with the signals for that Ethernet bus. This was a network chip, and this is an actually the flash. So I'm like, oh, okay, if we have the flash, that's cool. You know, no reason to open up that EMI shield, yay for me. All right, and so also um, look at connectors. So we have a micro USB, we have a regular USB. Um, this turns out to be a UART, and then also the pins underneath, um, some ethernet pins. And so to, you know, work, you can either work inside out looking at your chips or outside in, or even just, you know, do both ways and just, it depends on you. Like, what what are you interested in? What are you interested in finding out? Um, I'm, I expect that a lot of people here are probably just interested in the digital aspect of things. And if that's the case, you know, maybe you just end at the chip and just try and find, you know, some serial lines or something. Um, but if you're interested in, you know, how are people doing, you know, a circuit for whatever, um, just go get your multimeter, get the continue line, and see what components are connected to what and draw it out. Um, I mean, and it doesn't have to be digital either. Um, you can also look at, at the analog stuff. So go, so this device is powered up by the micro USB, micro USB connector. So go look at that. Um, it's up to whatever you're curious at, about. And so RTFM, read the three manual. Um, usually people replace the, the F in that acronym with something else. And so there's a lot of information in, in data sheets and, and they're out there, they're free. So you go and you just, you know, you look at these chips, you get the names and sometimes it's not straightforward. Like it took some time to try and find, okay, what's, what's this flash thing? Um, you know, you're not gonna find the, maybe the exact one right away. It takes some time. Um, and also there's, there's multi, you know, you'll find like a family variation and 
just give it some five minutes and you'll find it on Google. But it gives you the pinouts of the chip that you need. And also you'll probably find the other goodies. I didn't find it in this data sheet, but in other data sheets, especially like for microcontrollers or systems on a chip, they're gonna give you a schematic design. And usually it's, hey, we recommend that for these pins to use, um, to use this, this circuit layout. And engineers who are going to use that off the shelf chip are gonna be like, okay, why change it? If this is what the manufacturer for that chip recommends, usually someone's gonna stick with it unless you're trying to optimize for space or, or power or whatever. Okay, next one, donut holes. All right. Oh, well, I'll leave it there for a second. Drink some more coffee. Okay, so interfacing with the hardware. And I'm going much faster than I expected. So interfacing with the hardware, you're going to need um, a power supply, an oscilloscope, a logic analyzer, function generator, and a bus pyre other, or other bus interfacing device, and a debugger. I'm missing that bullet point. So you don't need all of these. It depends on what your goal is. Um, you'll probably need a power supply, especially if, if it's something that's battery powered and you just want to connect it um, just to direct power lines. Um, Oscilloscope, not so much. You don't, if you're just, you know, if you're just focused on serial interfaces, you probably don't need the oscilloscope. Um, logic analyzer, the same. If you have a debugger, if you have um, some, you know, like a bus pirate, you probably don't need the, the logic analyzer either. Um, logic analyzers kind of help you um, look at, look at serial lines um, and actually, see, see what they're what they're saying um, or even just give you some more information about um, about the data going back and forth um, if you're interested in the analog aspect um, function generators are very helpful uh, if you're working with something that you know deals with motors or has electrodes for some sensors or whatever um, debugging or even um, just figuring out how is this circuit conditioning a signal, a function generator can be helpful. So you just go in, you choose what signal you wanna put in, um, put in whatever um, chip and find uh, for some of these tools, would you need a decent one or will the cheaper version suffice? Um, it, that depends. If you're dealing with something that's very, um, let's say like for the oscilloscope, something that's very high high frequency, you probably will need a better oscilloscope. Um, I, I think I have it in one of the slides. You want to be aware of, you know, what the capability is of your power supply or of your tools and what it is you're actually trying to do. If you're trying to go and look at like some, some RAM chips, right? Those are very high frequency. They, um, RAM data buses, are very high frequency. If you have an oscilloscope kind of like what I have, I have a cheap one. Um, I'm not sure if you can see, you're not gonna be able to do that. Um, but for basic stuff that are that's out there, you know, just start off small. As you're learning and as you grow your skills, you can go and upgrade your stuff. <laughs> Thanks. Um, and uh, I, so for looking at the TP link, I tried, um, you know, not using as, as many tools as possible. And also because of COVID, you know, there's not a lot of like, there's not a lab that I can go to anymore. So, um, you know, just work with what you got. You'll, you'll find out um, what you'll need, but, you know, buying that thousand dollar, or thousands of dollar devices, um, I know it's it's popular. Like J Link is a popular um, debugger to get. You, you can you can get it when you need it, and you'll probably need it a little further out than what you what you think. Okay, so there are some um, so there's common serial buses that uh, are out there, um, and you know it's very good to know about them and how they work. So there's UR and RS 
So UR is 232, 422. So UR is just universal um, asynchronous, uh, I forget the term, um, but it just defines that there's a receive, transceive, and ground line. Um, RS-232 is, is a standard. Um, and so usually it's, it's used over UR. Um, so if you see there's no clock, so you have your receives, you have your, your transceive line and they cross. So for this trip, the send out line is gonna go to the received line of the other chip and then so on and so forth. And there's, there's expansions of this and a common one is RS-422. And it's the same thing you can see, but they have differential lines. So that means you know you have a plus and a minus. So it's just gonna be a reflection, a reflecting signal off of each other. Um, and this is only for um, redundancy. So if, so try and try, it's for the circuit. So if it detects it, so it can detect, detect any errors. Um, and, and so it's, it's laid out the same that the receive and send are crossed for the two devices. So yeah, keep in mind that there's no clocks here, right? Um, so, you know, how does, when it comes to serial, like how, how do you know, um, you know, if you're just going one, zero, one, zero, one, zero, one, how do you know um, that's what the sequence is or if it's not multiple ones and multiple zeros squished together? Um, and so uh, baud rate determines how long, um, you know, a single bit would be. And it's predetermined when it comes to these data bus lines. And so it's pretty, there's standard baud rates that are out there, but you know, you can, you know, be big brain and be smartly and start your way um, into, I guess I would say data bus analyzation and use an oscilloscope. And so you can go check the lines of your receive transceive and you'll need ground and measure the measure the smallest gaps. So what are the smallest square waves? What are the smallest gaps? And here you can see that, um, you know, it's this first line starts at this timestamp, the second line starts at this timestamp. And so you can, baud rate stands for bits per second. So you can calculate what the bits per second are for here. Um, and use an oscilloscope for measuring clocks and data rates. So yeah, being aware of that. So if you go and you see that there's a really high, um, high, high rate bus somewhere, um, you're probably not going to be looking at that. So usually, if it's um, high frequency, like like RAM, like DDR, when you're trying to interface with it, when um, you're trying, depending on how you create your connector and you're connecting to those lines it's going to impact the integrity of those signals. And those signals, because they're high rate, when you go to high frequency, things get very, very sensitive. You deal with parasitic capacitance, you deal with um, um, increased noise. It, so unless you have very high integrity tools or methods into looking at these things, you're probably not gonna get there as a hobbyist um, or even if, if you're not a very well-funded lab. Um, Okay, so I squared C and SPI. These are very, very important. So when a lot of times for a flash for ROM, they're going to be communicating over I squared C and SPI. A lot of um, sensors and anything that's kind of, I guess, interacting with the outside world usually, um, like uh, ADCs and, and DACs, so that those are um, kind of like level converters. Not really, but... Um, so they convert from analog to digital. And so, um, so, which is usually common when you're dealing with sensors or when you're dealing with motors um, and so forth. And so these lines are really good to see, okay, how are these, how is that data being sent to those sensors, to those drivers and how, um, and how does it communicate what it wants? Um, and so I'd squared C is a two line a data bus, and so you have SDA and SCL, and there's no clock. So this this data bus works by um, by specific level sets. So um, if there's a sequence of like if this line goes up and the and this line goes down, then you'll do like a read or um, 
uh, you know, a, or you'll request some information from a trip, I definitely recommend that you go in and I would have had time to go over it too. You go in and look at this data bus in the details. Um, some people find it intimidating. I wouldn't be intimidated. As long as you find a good source, it's fine. So find a good source. If you're reading something and it sounds confusing, it's probably not a good source. Just drop it and go somewhere else. Um, Analog Devices does have a good walkthrough for both of these data buses. So I definitely recommend that. Um, SPI, so SPI um, does have a clock. So you have MOSI and MISO. So it's master, master slave in and master in slave out. Um, and so this one works by, so these can both communicate at the same time. So the, the master can slave, send data to the slave at the same time the slave sends data to the master. Uh, and the clock determines, you know, what your, your data rate is for that. And there is a chip slick. So if you have multiple um, multiple chips over SPI, you you do have to increase your your you do have to have multiple lines. Whereas for I'd score C, you just have the master can only have can have only two lines, um, and it's shared across multiple um, multiple chips. Okay, JTAG. Uh, JTAG is, is used a lot for debugging and not, you know, um, you can get off the bat, like right off the bat, assume like, hey, this chip's not going to have JTAG. So um, the flash chip that we found earlier, that's not going to have JTAG. JTAG is something that's integrated in a chip itself. Um, and so it's used for debugging, for interacting with that chip, for enumerating what the hardware is doing in the inside out to uh, the developer. And so the, the core lines are uh, the test clock, the test mode select, uh, test data in, test data out. And so it's really just four pins. Um, and it's not, there's not really a standard. So it's like, oh, we only need four pins. But if you look at the different headers for JTAG for these various uh, creators, so TI has a 20 pin, 14 pin, ARM has 20 pin. There's, there's even more out there. Um, and they have the, all of these different pins and it's it's kind of like um, a, a different flavor. So it's just a a, a debugging kind of, um, you know, let's add frosting to the cake kind of thing. Uh, and JTAG is, is, is a comp, can be very complicated, um, but as long as you have, um, you know, the debugger for the chip that you're using, you probably won't have an issue. Um, and so then you're going to run into collecting. So, so um, you know, getting an AVR programmer, um, getting a PIC programmer. Um, as you interact with hardware, you'll go and collect um, some, you know, your, your JTAG debuggers. Uh, there are some universal ones out there, like the J-Link, but those are expensive. Um, and, you know, we like to save money here. Uh, OK, so connecting to the chip. Um, so you found the chip. We found the chip that we were interested in for the TP-Link. It's the, the, the flash right there. Um, so, you know, these pins are incredibly big. So we got very lucky there. Um, so we have these, usually um, these came with the log logic analyzer that I have. Um, we, when clipping these on, um, you know, there's, there's no connections, unwanted connections there. So we can easily use that. But what happens when these pins are very, very small? Um, so usually you'll have to get some, some wires, very small gauge wires, like 20 or 22, um, maybe even smaller, but if it was that small, I probably wouldn't do it. Um, and kind of, I, I call it giving the chip pigtails. So you just go and solder your wires onto the chip itself and, and just have it flay out so you can use um, uh, probably whatever connectors you have. Usually what's common is alligator, but alligator clips are very like big and bulky. Um, so it's not something that you can just clip onto these leads here. Um, and so if, if you can't, like if it is something that's small, if you, if it's too small for you to solder, you don't have wires. What's common um, is people use like to use sockets. 
So you have to actually desolder the chip off, put it in a socket um, so you can interact with the pins um, outside of, of the board itself. Uh, I like to use surfboards, not only because the name's cute, but because um, it's cheaper. Usually sockets tend to be expensive and then you have to get a socket for each and every chip. And then you'll say, oh, well, don't you have to get a surf for surfboard for every chip and every chip shape? Yeah, but a surfboard is going to be really cheap and you can probably make it yourself if you get into catting. Um, at the end of the day, you know, surfboards would probably be, um, it depends on the deal that you get, but maybe like $5 if you go and you print one yourself. A socket's going to cost like $50 or $70. Um, and why, if you're going to just open up a new piece of hardware with a, a new uh, chip with a different footprint, you know, uh, surfboards, cute, they're handy, um, you know, they're April approved. All right. So at this point, um, it's very straightforward. Like if, if you don't care about any of the analog circuits or if you don't care about um, anything else that's going on apart from, you know, getting to the software, getting to the serial buses, you know, now you can just pull the firmware, just get your bus. I'm talking about bus pirate a lot. So just now you just connect whatever lines that you need. So you see the, the, the MOSI MISO. So this, this chip here does talk over SPI. So you just connect those together and then just, you know, run the command and wait for it, the flash ROM to be on your computer. And if it's JTAG, it's um, depending on what tool you're using, you know, it's a similar procedure. It may, sometimes it, there's, there's a lot of um, new to, I guess, new tech into uh, keeping people from getting to JTAG, getting um, to the flash ROM by putting like fuses or, you know, uh, putting protections over those chips themselves. But if that's not there and you have those connections, just it's very quick, straightforward. And at this point, now that you have the, you know, the binary, all you have to do is go and put it into your favorite disassembler. Um, I never use Ghidra for any in embedded uh, boot images that I got, um, but you know, IDA free, is that chip supported in IDA? Cool, awesome. Or um, if you don't find a lot of support, I'm pretty sure you can probably find an emulator for Q, Q Emo. Q Emo is a emulator for various chips. So you can just kind of put it on there um, and, you know, you'll probably go through the debugging process on that. Um, yeah, so when dealing with, with, with things that aren't trying to keep you out, it's very simple, it's very straightforward. Um, but in the case of that's not the case, there's way more advanced methods. So, you know, doing continuity checks, having your multimeter, you know, seeing what wire, what, what components lay on what wire. For a very complex board that has multiple layers, that's probably going to be very tedious, and you're probably um, you're probably not going to get through that. So, what do you know professionals do that do look at these? So they do. There's PCB sanding. So they go and they sand down through the different PCB layers to try and see what the, what the wire and, and PCB layout is. Um, they use X-ray, X-raying PCBs to look at the different layers. Um, and then also I mentioned before that there's ASICs and there's um, ICs that are proprietary that don't have the information out there. People are really into decapping it. And so they, um, so VLSI is the, um, is the topic of looking at, uh, you know, into like these uh, integrated integrated circuits, circuits aren't the term um, in these chips and seeing what that what that um, what that wafer layout looks like. So um, you know, if someone like AMD wants to go and reverse engineer Intel stuff, this is probably what they're doing. They're decapping the chip, um, and there there are circumventions from keeping you from decapping it. And people use various methods from chemical ones to uh, more, I guess, brute force ones. Uh, and there's there's a cool website, I'll probably put it in the Discord because I have to find it, that goes through common 
um, you know, VLSI topologies. And I find that very interesting. So resources, um, books, my favorite books, Art of Electronics by Paul Horowitz. There's also a lab. So you might pick up this book. It's very big. Um, I have it back here. Um, let me get that. It's a very big book. Don't get intimidated by it. Um, I would very much recommend the, the lab book that they've also put out for it. It explains things a little bit more simple than the, the book itself. Uh, and it has nice pictures. Who doesn't like pictures? Hacking the Xbox by Bunny Huang. That one is, you'll see that anytime it comes to hardware reverse engineering, you'll see that quoted a lot. It's a very good book. Um, he goes into uh, how he, he, he actually got, does interact with some of the DDR components on, on the Xbox. And he has a, a really neat and complicated method that, you know, I mean, I'm not gonna be doing it here in, at that workstation, um, but it, it's a very good resource to learn from. Mm -hmm. Other websites with information would be uh, Analog Devices. Analog has a really good website and explains things really well. Um, All About Circuits does too. And EE Vlog has been around for some time. Um, it, you know, it's a very, I've used it a lot and you know, you'll find some really good information, especially someone like how to use um, different tools or like what, so like, um, I know someone had a question about tool sets. Um, so they'll, they'll rate like, hey, what skills, oscilloscopes to get, what power supplies and so forth. And when putting these slides together, I was trying to find like a component thesaurus. Um, Cause if, if you're very new to electronics, um, you know, there's huge variation in, in um, different components that are going to be there that you'll find. Uh, so if anyone knows a good component this, this artist, uh let me know. Um, I couldn't find one. Uh, there was a few, but you know, it, it very short. So if you if you have one, let me know. I'm curious. Okay, so where to find or buy tools? Obviously, we're not all made out of money bags. We don't have deep pockets. Uh, most of us are, are students. So, you know, we're not going to go out there and just throw down um, hundreds, thousands of dollars to try and um, get started with this stuff. Uh, so apart from the basics of just, you know, if you're just interested in digital, getting uh, a JTAG or, or a bus sniffer um, and, you know, a multimeter, which you can get for five dollars at like, like at Lowell's or something. Um, if you want to start playing with some of those more complex tools like an oscilloscope, function generator, or have like a nifty power supply, uh, there's there's some on campus. And I know things are kind of closed right now because of COVID, um, but that resource is there. And I'm, I'm pretty sure if you go and you talk to some of the, the lab techs uh, and ask for, you know, when there's open time, you can get access to those. Um, and, you know, they're there for your learning. Hackerspaces. I listed some hackerspaces that are nearby Cal Poly. Um, maybe not all of you are around there right now because of what's going on. Uh, but Mag Labs is, is right there by Cal Poly. Um, I've kind of been there a couple times. I don't know what their activities are right now. I don't expect them to be a lot, but they do have some, um, you know, some of the tools that I, I mentioned here. 23B is down in Fullerton. Um, they're one of their guys, Arclight, you know, uh, he, he's kind of the reason why I got into hardware RE. He did a similar talk um, back in my first uh, hacker con that I went to. Um, they, they definitely have some stuff there uh, and, and definitely stuff for analog as well. And all space labs. So one of the founders is actually doing a talk uh, as so I would recommend that uh, Null space labs is, uh, is very much a, a electronics um, and hacker hacker space. Um, Mag Labs is Mag Labs in 23B. They'll have things like if, if you need a CNC or if you need something more, um, I would say like mechanical. Uh, Null Space Labs has a lot of, of soldering irons and a lot of electronic tools. Um, so you'll definitely find that there. And you know, you buy used equipment. There's things 
there's a used oscilloscopes and stuff being sold on eBay. Um, back at my old job, when I worked in Woodland Hills, there was a liquidation shop. So um, there was a, a lot of tech companies were, um, were set around there. And so when they were going to renew the electronics or when they you know, renewed a lab, um, a lot of that equipment would show up at that shop. I don't think it's open anymore. I don't think that liquidation thing is there uh, just because of the times. But I'm sure you'll find it again once things are, are, are back in motion. All right, the last donut, double chocolate donut. And yeah, that's that's my talk. I, I ended a, a little early. Uh, thank you for your time. Like I said, this is the first time I did this talk. So give me feedback. Let me know, you know, too much pictures, too little pictures, too vague. Give me more diagrams. Um, you know, complete trash, try again, or don't come back. Let me know. Uh, you can email me at mosey at proton mail.com, um, Twitter at um, underscore Mosey. And I, I don't think my site's up, but I do have a website and I'm also in the Discord. So feel free to hit me up. And if you're interested in this, I, I do want to just give a chat to like, you know, here, here are some talks that I looked on the schedule that are kind of related in topic. So the binary exploitation workshop, this one I can give April stamp of approval. Um, DG, the, the um, facilitator for that workshop. Very insightful, very knowledgeable. Uh, Rock the cash, cash box. Um, don't know the speakers, but uh, I, there, it looks like it's a talk about going into an ATM. So you'll be seeing stuff as into um, analyzing bus protocols and, and um, um, reverse engineering how something works. So it'd probably be a more um, in application that you can kind of see like, oh, like what tools are they using um, and apply whatever, hopefully you learned something here and into that talk. And then there's another one, intro to embedded device security testing. That one seems like a talk on, um, you know, protecting your embedded devices. So, uh, you know, maybe he'll bring up stuff of, uh, you know, latest, latest methods into keeping you out. And so you can think about like how to get around those or, you know, keep them in mind when you're opening something up and you run into it. Uh, so always good to plug other speakers that are talking. Uh, yeah, if you have any questions, let me know. Well, thank you so much, April. Uh, that was incredibly insightful. I honestly like didn't imagine how much work it went into like just getting to the like a, to a device's firmware and how much like just get in from the hardware and stuff. Thanks. Um, I think we can, oh, okay. We have a question in the Q and A. Um, I never knew about the static bag on top. I didn't either until I was like chastised and I was working in the lab, um, at my job and one of the, <laughs> the tech gave me a good lecture. Um, so don't make the same mistake as me. No static bags, no placing things on top of static bags. So we have a couple questions on the Q and A. Um, I don't know if you can see the. I cannot. Are they different? Ah, got it. Yes. Okay. Really basic question: talking about risks to hardware and what could happen to a phone's internal components when exposed to high heat. I accidentally left my phone in a thin bag in the sun for an hour last summer, and my phone has been a little slower ever since, even though it's relatively new. Um, so yeah, some some components can be damaged with high heat. Um, I, I, I don't think that it would cause your phone to be slower. Um, that could be the case. Maybe there's um, some more uh, lower level components that have been, whose integrity have been compromised. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, high heat can impact devices. What's a flash chip? Good question. I'm sad that I did not. <laughs> explain it well enough. So a flash chip is where, um, is kind of basically like your embedded device's hard drive. So it's just a lot of um, the software information, the software boot image is gonna be sitting on there or um, any data that's saved for, to be used, you know, when it boots back up is gonna be saved there. So it's just like a little, a little memory device. Um, and, you know, sometimes, 
if it's like an and or or flash um you know it it's read and readable there are some roms that are out there that that can only be flashed once so you have one time um image that's written to that chip and you know that's it it's there um yeah, hope, hopefully that, that answers your question. And I guess that, that's that's it for questions. Uh, I believe that is. Thank you so much. <laughs> awesome, thanks. I, I know I ended early, so um, I will be around if you, have, if you just want to chat or if another question pops up later. Uh, don't forget a giveaway. So I'll be closing that probably like an hour or two. Um, yeah, let's take advantage of that. Free, free tools. Thanks, guys. Thank you so much, April. Yeah, later.